I'm Nadja Swart for BizNews.com and joining me today is Dr. Robert Lustig, uh, Professor of Pediatric Endocrinology at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Lustig, thank you so much for your time. Uh, my pleasure, Nadja. By way of introduction, what is your background? Well, I am a pediatric neuroendocrinologist. Now, that means I take care of children and I study how the brain controls hormones and how hormones control the brain. Um, in particular, I've been most interested in obesity and the obesity epidemic, but I'm also very interested in the type 2 diabetes epidemic that has basically taken all developed and developing countries by storm. So there's a certain amount of metabolism, a certain amount of neuroscience that goes into figuring this all out. And you opted for pediatric endocrinology because? Well, I went into pediatrics to take care of children and also to avoid chronic disease. And what's funny is that you know, for the last 25 years, that's all I've done is take care of chronic disease. Children are now getting the diseases of adults. Children are getting the diseases of aging. And, you know, it's partly fallen to me to try to figure out why this is and what to do about it. And what have you found so far? Well, uh, many things, but in particular, um, our food environment. Now, People say that very glibly. Oh, yes, of course, you know, the food environment is, you know, much different than it used to be. And, of course, that's true. And people say, and, of course, people eat more now than they used to. And, of course, that's true also. But the question is why? Why do they eat more now? We have a hormone that is made by our fat cells that tell our brain, don't do that. Don't eat so much. That hormone is called leptin, and leptin is supposed to basically act as our body's weight thermostat. So it's not supposed to let us overeat. It's not supposed to let us overgain weight. But clearly, something is wrong with leptin because we are all overeating and we are all gaining weight. So clearly, our leptin is not working. So my task, if you will, my scientific research over the last 25 years is to try to understand what happened to leptin and why is this occurring? And it turns out in, you know, 10 words or less, insulin is the bad guy in the story. Insulin blocks leptin and insulin also makes fat. And so our insulin levels are now four times higher today than they were 25 years ago. And then the question is, well, why is that? And I can answer that in one, one word. Sugar. Dietary sugar. The stuff you put in your coffee. High fructose corn syrup, maple syrup, honey, agave. Basically, everything is sweet today, and it didn't used to be. Well, it turns out sugar has very specific effects on both the liver and the brain that lead to this leptin problem and lead to type 2 diabetes, and lead to fatty liver disease, and lead to early death. And that brings me to my next question. In 2013, you did a TED talk um, about sugar, calling it the elephant in the kitchen. Can you please expand Indeed. on this? Sure. So back in 2006, I realized that sugar was metabolized in the liver virtually identically to that of alcohol. And it made sense that that would be the case because after all, where do you get alcohol from? Fermentation of sugar, it's called wine. We do it in Napa and Sonoma every day. The big difference between alcohol and sugar is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step of metabolism called glycolysis. For sugar, we do our own first step. But after that, it doesn't matter. What your cells see, what your mitochondria, the little energy-burning factories inside each of your cells see, is virtually identical, whether it's alcohol or sugar. And so it shouldn't surprise anyone that children now get the diseases of alcohol, type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease, without the alcohol. So 
Our food supply has basically been contaminated. It has been tainted in such a way as to promote chronic metabolic disease, not just amongst adults, but in fact amongst children. And the only way to fix it is to call out the problem. And so I gave a TED Talk explaining this, the elephant in the kitchen. And, you know, sadly, lots of people now understand this, and certainly, you know, that has gone viral, and I'm very pleased that the education has uh, progressed, but I haven't seen very much in the way of food industry action on this issue. What about the addictive qualities of alcohol? Are children also experiencing that via their consumption of sugar? Absolutely. So there's an area of the brain right in the center called the nucleus accumbens, also known as the reward center. And it is responsive to chemicals such as cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol, sugar. It's also responsive to behaviors such as gambling, social media, internet gaming, pornography. Bottom line, there's only one reward system. Sugar stimulates that reward system. It's why we like sugar so much. It's why sugar is irresistible. Well, the food industry knows that. And they know that the more they add, the more you buy. Now, if sugar were just addictive, like, for instance, caffeine. You know, there are coffee places all over the world now because caffeine's addictive, but it's not toxic. So if sugar were addictive and not toxic, no one would care, and we'd be lining up for ice cream sodas the same as we do for, you know, um, lattes. But the fact is sugar is toxic. Sugar inhibits mitochondrial functioning. Okay? The little energy burning factories inside each of your cells that make the energy that powers your cells. Sugar actually inhibits that process. So it is both toxic and addictive. And when something is both toxic and addictive, we regulate it. We regulate tobacco, it's toxic and addictive. We regulate alcohol, it's toxic and addictive. But for sugar, we do nothing. And so that has been part of my advocacy for the past, I would say, 10 years. It seems that um, on top of only doing nothing, they've used this to their advantage by putting more Absolutely. sugar incrementally into everything. Absolutely. They know when they add it, you buy more. And I can prove that. There is a, uh, uh, an economic phenomenon which I'm sure is well known to your audience, as this is biz news, called price elasticity. So what is price elasticity? It's how much does consumption change when the price of an individual item goes up by 1%? Now, if you have a, uh, an item that is completely price elastic, then consumption should go down by 1% when price goes up by 1%. When something is price inelastic, then consumption doesn't change. Well, anything that's price inelastic is so because of its hedonic properties. You gotta have it. It's your fix, as it were. Well, the three most price inelastic food items are fast food, soda, and juice. What do those three things share in common? Sugar. Sugar is and, addictive. Mm. It's addictive at the biochemical level, it's addictive at the neuroimaging level, and it's addictive at the societal and epidemiologic level. And so in, in what ways and to what extent rather are big food, big pharma and big government responsible for this current epidemic of obesity and chronic disease? Well, they've learned over the past 40 years that number one, we love it. Number two, we'll pay any amount for it. 
And number three, when they add more, we buy more. They know that it's addictive. And I know they know because they've told me so. The point is that there are no laws preventing this. It's perfectly legal. And so they're going to drive this bus until the wheels fall off, until someone steps in to do some sort of regulation. Now, we have regulation in a few countries. About 28 have sugar taxes, including the UK, for one, okay, and including my native San Francisco and you know uh, several uh, cities around California who understand this process. Now, people say uh, taxing food is a disaster. It's regressive against the poor. Well, what's more regressive against the poor? Diabetes is more regressive against the poor. And if you can save one patient from getting diabetes, okay, that's a very big deal. And we've already done that. We've actually been able to save millions of cases of diabetes by increasing the price of soda for that reason. In addition, at UCSF, we instituted something we call the Healthy Beverage Initiative. If you come onto our campus, you cannot buy a sugared soda. It doesn't exist. And vendors who bring food onto campus are not allowed to sell sugar beverages. It's an so does edict this include that we passed. Diet Coke and um, like sugar-free carbonated You're, drinks? They are allowed sugar-free carbonated drinks, yes. And okay. I'm not going to okay. tell you that those are good, but you know, baby steps, one thing at a time. Yes. The fact of the matter is we actually studied our population. We studied our employees before and after the institution of this soda ban. And what we found was that waist circumference went down and insulin sensitivity went up, inferring an improvement in metabolic health just because we got the soda off the campus. So we have the data to demonstrate the benefits, the health benefits of reducing consumption. So the question now is, how do you implement that at scale? And we are still working on that, but we have several ideas. In your book, Fat Chance, which made it to the New York Times bestseller list, you documented the politics and the science that led to the current pandemic of obesity and chronic disease. Can you briefly unpack the science and politi- politics? <laughs> okay. That's, that's a tall order, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Here's what I can say. People think that sugar are just calories. You know, you throw um, a gram of sugar into a bomb calorimeter and you explode it and you get four calories, all right? Sugar is not energy. Yes, it will burn in a bomb calorimeter, but in fact, sugar inhibits mitochondrial functioning. It actually inhibits burning. It also inhibits growth. My colleague, Dr. Efrat Mansenigo Ornan at Hebrew University Jerusalem showed very clearly that sugar actually inhibits bone growth in an animal model. And my other colleagues have shown that in fact, sugar hijacks growth because of its effects on insulin leading to cancer and uh, uh, relapse of cancers as well. So if a food does not help promote burning, and does not help promote growth, is it a food? And the argument that I'm making is that, in fact, sugar meets the criteria for poison, not food. Now, that's a stretch for some people, but in fact, the scientific data support the argument. You referred yesterday to you being told that you're interfering with big food, big pharma, big government. Uh, You've intensely intensely challenged them. What pushback have you received as a result? 
Well, uh, initially, when I first started talking about this, I received an enormous amount of negative press and a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, attempts at discrediting me. Uh, back in 2012, 2013, uh, I met with quite a bit of resistance and pushback. I have to say that uh, for the most part, that resistance has really um, softened and faded to a great extent. Now, I will admit that most of the food industry continue to utilize sugar and they continue to stand by this notion that sugar is just empty calories and we have them on record as saying so in, in both you know, uh, marketing uh, uh, pitches and also uh, in lawsuits. But the reason that they're saying that is because this is their only uh, ability to try to deflect their culpability. So it's not surprising that they feel this way. Having said that, there are several food uh, industry uh, actors who understand that in fact sugar is the problem and are doing something about it. Many of them are reformulating their, um, their portfolios. I am actually assisting a CPG company in the Middle East right now at no, uh, uh, at no pay to myself. Uh, uh, KDD, uh, Kuwaiti Danish Dairy Company, um, recognizes that they are part of the problem and they want to be part of the solution. And so we have organized a scientific advisory team to go through all 176 products to re-engineer them so that they will actually be metabolically healthy rather than metabolically uh, uh, poisonous. And so we're very proud of that work and uh, KDD is rolling out uh, uh, these new products uh, slowly, but uh, the first two have already hit the shelves. So we're going to see how things go. Another one of your best-selling books, Metabolical. Um, can you tell me what were the primary findings explored in this book? <laughs> Another tall order. <laughs> Again, a, 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 a loaded question. <laughs> what I can say is that I wrote Fat Chance because I realized that the industry's mantra, you are what you eat, was incorrect. In fact, you are what you do with what you eat, what you metabolize, because metabolism is more important to metabolic health than calories. Well, in the eight years since Fat Chance, I realized there's an entire dark underbelly of both politics and subterfuge by the food industry in an attempt to try to um, uh, provide disinformation and to propagandize the public, not just the American public, but in fact the international community. And so I had to put this into, um, into prose uh, to make it very clear to the audience. It is not you are what you do with what you eat, it is you are what they did with what you eat. That the politics for them come first. And so, um, uh, you know, this, th this book is half science, half expose. So this is particularly interesting for me. How linked is gut health to our mental health? A very good question. Um, so first of all, you should understand that mental health disorders are skyrocketing all over the world particularly in the United States, but in other countries as well. Now, this preceded the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has made it much worse. God knows. Virtually every adolescent has a mental health disorder today. It's really, you know, quite remarkable. And uh, I'm very aware of that. Having said that, this did precede the COVID-19 pandemic. We now have data to demonstrate that um, mental health disorders such as addiction, depression, uh, 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 ADD, OCD, schizophrenia are mitochondrial disorders, disorders of the mitochondria. 
My colleague, Dr. Christopher Palmer, is uh, publishing a book called Brain Energy, where he posits that, in fact, all psychiatric diseases are actually metabolic diseases of the brain. And I concur. I think that's exactly right. And that the primary driver is our processed food supply. And that when you alter patient, patients' diets to get rid of processed food, their mental health improves because their mitochondrial function improves. And we have data to support that. And just to close off with, what basic tips would you give to a country like South Africa that you know most of the citizens live in poverty and so are financially yeah. constrained in respect of their diets? Indeed. So, obviously, currently, ultra-processed food is cheaper than real food. And the reason it's cheaper is because of food subsidies. Not because there's something inherently inexpensive about ultra-processed food. It's because we actually pay, governments pay for those subsidies that allow that ultra-processed food to be cheaper. Now, there is no economist on the planet who believes in food subsidies because they distort the market. I think that food subsidies have to go because we are subsidizing all the things that are killing us. And ultimately, we may benefit economically from the food subsidy, but we end up paying it in medical health care costs. And in fact, society ends up paying in medical health care costs to the point where it's breaking the bank, not just for the medical budget, but for the entire budget of every developed and developing country around the world because of health care, because of metabolic health issues, because of diabetes. So this is not a good trade. It's not okay to have cheap food and expensive health care. If you think that somehow these two pots of money are in different silos, you are mistaken. They are part of the same silo. And ultimately, we are paying for the food industry's culpability. So my first suggestion is get rid of food subsidies. And if we do that, then real food will become cheaper and more available even to the impoverished. And so we can actually do better by them by improving their metabolic health and saving millions and millions of dollars and kroners and everything else uh, 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 worldwide. Dr. Lustig, thank you so much for your time. I'm Najaswat for biznews.com.